So, like I said, so this style that we've just talked about works really well with narrative. But there's other genres, there's other types of flavors to scripture. And so we want to talk about what those flavors are. So here's some new information. You guys ready? So new information. What are those different genres and types? So the first thing I want to talk about is the genre of the law. When we're looking at the law, the law is found in uh, Leviticus and Numbers, Deuteronomy a little bit, a little bit in, in uh, Genesis 2. When we're looking at the law, we need to have one understanding in mind. And it's what God was wanting the law to be, and then how we can study it. So here's my words for this. The law is God's definition of righteousness and guidelines for what it takes to be righteous. Mm -hmm. That's the law, right? But when you realize, realize this, every time you're trying to interpret and study the law, realize this one thing. The law was revealed, was to reveal man's reliance on God alone. That was the purpose of the law. And so when you're reading that, you begin to go, okay, now wait a minute. God says, this is what it takes to be righteous. Also, the law says, this is what it means. You can't do it. You can't be righteous enough, which means you have to rely fully on me. Now, here's the sadness of the story of Israel is they took this truth that God says, I will be with you, and the law is my proof to you that I love you and will be with you. And the Israelites turned it around and said, the law is how I prove my love for God. When you turn that over like that, then it becomes what we call legalism. All those things, other or those other words, because we say, what was it? What God intended the law to be is not what is, especially in Jesus's time, what was actually taught about the law. The law was all about the way to say, this is my proof that I love God. This is my proof that I'm in line with God. This is my proof that I'm righteous and you're not. <laughs> when the law, the very beginning, was designed to say, you can't do it. I will do it for you. I will do it with you. I will be with you in, in this. So God's definition of righteousness and guidelines what it takes. So when you're looking at those passages that you can see that they're dealing with the law, especially in Deuteronomy and Numbers and um, Leviticus, you're looking at all these weird statements about do this and do this and do this and if thens and all that I can tell you. Begin studying about what covenants are. So go to your commentaries. Go to your study notes, go to your dictionaries, and learn about what covenants are, and learn about some of these Hebrew customs. Uh, this is where some uh, books will come in handy. Um, different, different scholars will have different books about the customs of Israel, the customs of ancient, the ancient Hebrews. Um, as I began to study through my Jerusalem project, the model that I'm making about with Jerusalem, I started realizing there's a whole, I mean, the, the geography of Jerusalem God is working through that. And it's just an amazing, amazing journey. So that's the law. That's the, the that's the, the genre that we call the law. We have to know, we have to realize that every time we're looking at the law, we're looking at God's defining of righteousness, what it takes to be righteous, and he's reminding us, his position is to say that man can't do it, but God is the one we rely on. Make sense? So the narrative, we've already talked about narrative, but I want to talk about that anyway. Narrative is God's historic description of what he did for his people. That's it. Now, I'm going to, can I toot my own word for a second? Here it is. Um, I worked really hard today when I was developing these slides. <laughs> Watch this. J just, just bask with me for a second. So God's definition, ready? God's historic description. So it's a D word. That's hard to do, guys. That's hard to do, right? So the narrative is God's historic description of what he did for his people. Key word historic. It's all about history. These are events that happen. It's describing what he did for his people. When you're reading narrative and you want to interpret that through narrative, narrative was what the narrative was to tell the story of how God was involved with his people. So when you're looking at that, always keep in mind what was God doing? 
and probably even ask yourself that question what's God doing in this story? Study this. Pair biblical stories with secular history and see how they fit together. Um, we covered in my Bible class for Kings, we were covering the, the, the we were covering Acts. We're looking at when uh, Paul went to two cities, and the cities were the birthplace of Pythagoras and the birthplace of who wrote Homer? Uh, yeah, the Iliad. Yeah, the Iliad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, so Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey. Right, that's it. So yeah. the birthplace. One city was the birthplace of Homer. The other city was the birthplace of, the, of uh, Pythagoras. Both of those would have been probably tour spots back in Paul's day. Um, let's go to see the home of Pythagoras, right? I don't know if that's true, but um, I would imagine. What's that? The map guy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember, this is a side note, I remember thinking, well, how am I ever going to utilize a Pythagorean theorem? <laughs> that's just so beyond me. And then, uh, Probably three or four months ago, uh, I realized I needed to have another, some more attic space, so I had to cut another hole in my ceiling for the attic space. And I was like, I need to make it so I can fit a four foot object through this hole, which means I can need to go diagonal. I'm like, what is the formula for this? And it's, and when I said, West is like, it's a Pythagorean theorem. And I was like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> you're kidding me? So, yes, I used a the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> And it works. Like we were up in the end of last night, and we're like, everything's fitting through this hole. It's working there. <laughs> All right, so narrative. God's historic description. Another one is wisdom. This is God's poetic declaration. Word. Thank you. God's poetic declaration of his heart and how we feel about him. So when we read wisdom literature, we remember this and we realize that wisdom is a reflection of how we feel as God. So those powerful words that God uses, uh, we feel the same way. Study this. Understand, learn about, refresh your memory about what English, how English uses metaphor. Because that's one of the only ways that we can, we can translate some of these um, ancient Hebrew poetry is using our own metaphors. Uh, and so understand how we as English speakers use metaphors. And then learn about this. What it means, uh, part of Hebrew poetry is this called Hebrew parallelism. So look that up. That's your homework. Just look at it, look this up. And it's a, it's a way that uh, ancient Hebrews used rhyme. They didn't rhyme with phonetics like we would. They rhymed with thought. So if the thought was rhyming with another thought, they would pair those things together. But there's more to it than that. Yeah. I want to... Um, I want us to watch a big one. So you guys see how this works? And you also, you see how um, to use, if, if you were to do a hermeneutic or a, a homiletic as in, in the same way that you would do a narrative, you might miss or misapply some things. But with poetry, to understand, okay, you, you're like reading and say, okay, I, this sounds like a poem. And you can confirm that by looking it up in a commentary and, and they'll say this is a poem or or in your study Bible, they'll say this is a poem. And so you're going to confirm that. But you'll be able to tell if it's a poem versus, I mean, just, just by the verse they used as, a, as an example. It, it's poetic. It just sounds different. And so you'll be able to tell what is uh, when it becomes a different genre for the most part. Um, and so when you come to that, go, uh, go into the next mode and say, okay, where's those couplets? Where's the new patterns? And then instead, your homiletic will look like um, here's here's the two verses, and those verses will be those two uh, couplets will be put together. You'll say, okay, now this means that, and this couplet means this, and this couplet means this, and you'll you'll be able to interpret the couplets because you're understanding you're reading poetry, right? And so there is so much more to this also about poetry. You saw the words in here. I was scrolling across the video. Um, and so, again, people devote their better part of their lives studying just Hebrew poetry. We're not going to cover any kind of extensive thing in, in a 15-minute uh, Bible study. Um, so let's move on to the next one. we got poetry. we got some other um, uh, 
move this around here. All right, so narrative, wisdom, this is the poets, the poetic structure, the declaration. The next part is the epistles. Um, the epistles, the epistle is a word that means, just means letter, and so you can guess what the epistles are. It's a lot of Paul's writing, his epistles. And you, you can tell there's a different way to understand those because what epistles are is God's expositional discourse. Right? God's expositional discourse for understanding his grace and mercy. You read all throughout Paul, and Paul is trying to convince us of a case. He's telling us this is what we need to understand. It's a discourse he's having with his readers, and he's teaching us. And so when you look at an epistle, you're saying, okay, what is, what is trying to be taught? That's the question you're asking. The main purpose was to teach, reform, or to encourage. I mean, reform is also to rebuke. There are some times that Paul says, uh, you're not supposed to have relationships with your mother-in-law. You're just not supposed to. Corinthians, <laughs> right? Um, and so he, so part of these epistles is this expositional discourse to either teach, reform, or to encourage. Uh, my favorite uh, is Philippians. It's, it's just one book, one section, but it has all these in here. It teaches, Paul's trying to teach Philemon. He's also reforming Philemon by saying, I could, he says, Paul says, I could order you to, right. to, to take back the slave. I could order you like, to do that, but I'm not going to because I believe you're going to do it because you love, you, you, you because you're a loving person. You've been changed by Christ. And so, um, so all of these things. So Philemon is, is so rich. I love it. So what do you want to do? So study these things. Study the, study the cultural, I think I spoke that wrong, I'm not sure. Cultural context of the original intent. That's the biggest thing when it comes to the epistles. Try, what you're trying to do is not discover what God is saying to you first. You're saying, what is, what is Paul saying to the original reader? How is the, the reader? So when you're looking at uh, Philemon, what does Philemon learn through this letter? And when you say, when you're asking that, then you say, from what lessons to, from Paul to Philemon can I apply in my life? Instead of going at it and saying, what can I learn from Philemon? No, learn from what Paul's saying to Philemon. Sounds like a nuance, but it makes a big difference in how you interpret scripture. So understand some of the cultural context of the original intent and the reader's understanding. What was Paul trying to say to Philemon? And what was Philemon hearing from Paul? And so that's what the epistles are. And the next one is apocalyptic. Did I spell that one right? Looks like it. Looks like it. This is what I spell right. This one. Oh, <laughs> See, there it is. There it is. God's prophetic it. display of his heart and judgments. Um, so... Realize this, that apocalyptic literature, and you'll know exactly what it talks about there because it's weird, right? So it's the fourth telling of God's intent through imagery, symbols, and types. I have a picture. There's mine right there. People get after the angels, angels be like, be ye not afraid. Um, over Christmas, Marshall saw one that somebody said, I put a biblically accurate angel on top of my tree. And it was this <laughs> gross looking thing coming out of the tree. Because, I mean, if you think about the way angels are described, especially in Daniel, um, don't want to meet one, really. Don't want to meet one. Be cool for a split second after I, well, I'll leave it there. So I thought I would show you that because the symbolism and the typology that's being used in a lot of the apocalyptic literature is strange. So uh, this is also, let me go back to That's uh, probably where C.H. C.S. Lewis got it. If he saw a picture like that. Right, right. <laughs> so when it comes to, dis when it comes to um, interpreting ap apocalyptic literature, you got to know the cultural context that help with strange concepts. Know those things. Do not read into the text. And this is where most, often, most people get in trouble. 
is when they try to, to assign the symbols of, of apocalyptic literature to the things that they know about. Um, you look at some timelines about how uh, there's an eagle sometimes described in apocalyptic literature. Well, eagle, the United States is an eagle, so it's the United States. So you assign something that may not be appropriate to assign to that symbol because we don't know the cultural context of that age, whether it was for when John wrote, say, to, to, to the, wrote his, uh, his, his revelation. So it's, this is where we get into most trouble because we want to try to make sense of it, and so we try to assign uh, meaning to the symbols that we understand it and may not do it just right. Let me go 